usually going to be the high, high frequencies. All right, so we've been talking so much about, about angels and demons and everything. And I had an experience um, this week that really got me down back to the basics of Christianity. And we, you know, we've been eating a lot of meat from the word lately and I want to bring us right back down because I, I had a, a very interesting experience. It was, uh, it was Wednesday and I knew I needed to get to the bank and put some cash into the bank. I had, I had done some errands and I was in the downtown and thought, I don't really have time to go to the bank, but I knew something was going to be taken out of my account, a bill that automatically comes out. So I had a stoplight, I, I stopped and checked my bank and sure enough, I'm in overdraft. But I was waiting for another expense to come in for three days, actually, waiting for this one one amount of money to come in from a certain source. Still hadn't come in, and I'd gone into overdraft. Didn't even, so I looped back around, parked at RBC over here on, uh, is it 4th Street? Anyway, I park and I walk around to into the bank machine area, and there's, there's a fellow standing there looking down. I thought, I'm looking for, I knew he was looking for a handout, but he wouldn't engage with me. There were two other girls at the bank machine. So, and I go to the bank machine every week with, with the offerings here, put them into the ministry, uh, into the ministry account. So I, I know how this thing works. So he wouldn't engage with me. I go to the bank machine, I pull out my cash, put my card in, my code in, hit deposit. And as soon as the, the thing opens to, to swallow up all my cash, the guy looks around and goes, you wouldn't happen to have a 20, would you? And all of a sudden the money is out of my hands and into the machine. I went, I just put it in the machine. No sooner did I say that, and every week I'm at this bank machine, it spits it out at me. So I went, I, I still don't know why it spat it out at me, so I went, this must be for you. So I grabbed the 20 and handed it to him. And I, I thought, you know, and before I was saying, you know, Lord, I trust you with my finances. And I do that every, every day. I trust you, I trust you. So that 20, though it kind of hurts sometimes, there you go. So then I didn't go back to the deposit. I thought, there's something wrong with the machine or something wrong with me or whatever. So I put my hand in my pocket and I engaged with this guy for a little bit. And, and uh, Found out his name, where is he, where is he from, and whatnot. And God will probably have a follow up for me at some point. He'll remember me, and I'll remember him. So when that was over, I, I, I get out of the bank machine, and all of a sudden I feel my phone a little. Bzz. So I check it. The money was deposited. I mean, just in the right moment. And so I'm walking to my vehicle, going, God, walking with you is so amazing. And I'm just, I'm celebrating, turn off the radio, I'm just celebrating him, telling him how much I, I love him. And then I got stopped at a stop, stoplight, actually right by Central Restaurant there on St. Clair. It was pretty busy and people are going um, across and I'm at the red light and on Grand they got there. And I'm looking at all these people and they're all just doing their own thing. And my heart started to break. And I know what, none of them are paying attention to you, Lord. None of them. Well, probably none of them. So, as I, my heart's breaking for the Lord, I felt him say, just in that still small voice that I don't hear with my ears, but I hear it in, somewhere in my gut. Yeah, they've forsaken my first love. They've forsaken their first love. And I thought, man, that's what I'm preaching on. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. This is chapter 2 and chapter 3 are the seven letters to the churches of, of Asia Minor. And they're Jesus writing these letters, or actually reciting them to John the Revelator, who's writing them down. And they're, they're encouragements, but, and there's rebukes, and there's warnings, and there's promises. Well, this one... Is, is the first one. It's, it's to the church in Ephesus. 
And it goes this way. So this is Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. In other words, this is Jesus. Walking amongst and the lampstands of the churches. He's walking amongst the churches. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You've persevered and you've endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Man, I want him to write that letter to me. You got discernment between good and evil. You got hard work. You got endurance. You got perseverance. I mean, he is, I see your good deeds. This is a good church. Verse 4. Yet I hold this one thing against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Huh. I thought this was a good letter. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's some scary words. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. You've forsaken your first love. Consider the heights from which you have fallen. In other words, I don't... Now let me finish the sentence first. I don't care about your perseverance, your good deeds, your hard work, your discernment. I don't care about any of those as much as I care about your love. You are called to love. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this scary thing. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? Now listen to the things that we try to, we try to achieve as Christians. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. There's no relationship. I never knew you. There's no knowledge. You have no knowledge of me. I have no knowledge of you. There's no relationship. 1 Corinthians 13. Listen again to the pursuits of these high pursuits. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Now this goes both ways. We're talking about God. But God says many times through his Bible that the way you can love me is by loving other people. Right? Jesus sums, sums up the Bible in Matthew chapter 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And the second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The whole Bible Love God, love one another. Jesus says, when you do this to the least of these, this is Matthew chapter 25, when you do these things, when you do things to the least of these, you're doing it not for me, to me. You, you can't separate the two. First John, uh, he talks, in, in, in John's epistle in First John, he talks about how you can't separate, how, how can you say you love God whom you haven't seen? when you're hating the, the, your brother who you can see. You can't separate the two. But the main thing that I want to I hit today is loving God. Because I do believe it's easier to achieve loving each other, doing good to each other. But even, I mean, even that's separated, isn't it? In, in some of the passages, 
I know your hard deeds, your perseverance. I see your good deeds towards one another. I see that even if you give all your goods to the poor, well, that's loving other people. But if you don't love God, when was the last time you just, you just said, God, I love you? Just as simple as that, God, I love you. I think we get caught up in all the things that, 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 that he's asking us to do and, and, you know, angels and demons and the schemes and we're going to take authority over this. We're going to take, that's why at the end of every lesson in, in the intent part, angels and demons, I end with, now let's focus on Jesus. Let's focus on God. Because ultimately, ultimately, you're not here. You're not here to get married, have kids, get an education, have a vocation, have a ministry for God. The reason you're here is to have a loving relationship with God. That's the reason you exist. Everything else is secondary. Jesus even took a, a very severe uh, analogy when, when he said, or, or uh, you know, connection when he said, unless you hate mother, father, wife, children, compared to, and he doesn't say compared to, but I'm, I'm putting it in there to make it a little more palatable, compared to how much you love me, you're not worthy of me. There shouldn't be any other love that comes close to your love for God. Look at the heights from which you've fallen, he says. You've forsaken your first love. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And I know I've harped on this a couple of times, but I need to say it again. We see it in the Old Testament with Samuel, where he is, from the moment he's weaned, his mother and father take him to the temple. He doesn't have a normal education. His education is learning everything about God. Learning everything about the Torah, the Old Testament. Because, of course, he's in the Old Testament. There is no New Testament. See that? So that he knows his education was God. But when God calls him, the boy is in the temple beside the Ark of the Covenant. And God says, Samuel. Samuel doesn't recognize his voice. Runs out to see Eli, the, his mentor, the priest at the time. And Eli goes, I didn't call you. Go back. <laughs> Go back, poor kid, eh? So he goes back to Samuel. Goes back to Eli. No, I didn't call you. Go back. And, and Eli's starting to catch something. If, 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 he, if you hear that voice again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So the boy goes back. Samuel. And all of a sudden, Samuel knew, knew, there's that key word, relationship. He knew God. It says in that text, Samuel did not recognize the voice of the Lord because the word of God had not yet been revealed to him. That's interesting. Has, has God been revealed to you? Or is he just a subject? That's actually one of my, one of my fears with people when they say, I'm going to Bible college or they go to a Christian school because God is caught in textbooks and essays and exams and multiple choice questions instead of God being God long before there was ever a college about God. I could get caught up in learning about Crystal. We're married. I'm gonna learn as much about, so we wake up in the morning, good morning, good morning, hey, no time to talk. I can go learn as much about you as I can. And I get my truck and I go to her hometown and I talk to all of her old school buddies and all of her old friends and I'm learning. I'm taking notes and taking notes. I get home really late. Hey, how was your day, Chris? Oh, good. I learned so much about you. I got to go to bed. Good night. Wake up. Wake up the next morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, no time to talk. I'm gonna learn so much about you. And so I go and I interview all of her, all of her family. Oh, I'm learning stuff about her. Oh yeah. And so I'm, you know, I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes. I get home and say, how was your day? Oh, I'm exhausting. I learned so much about you. You're an amazing person. Can I wake up the next morning? Oh, I'm so excited. 
I've learned, I think I've learned so much about you. I'm now going to teach others. I've already advertised it, so no time to talk. I get ready and I leave. And I go to a building and I gather a whole bunch of people and I'm going to say, this is what, who Crystal is. You get the picture? I never knew you. I never knew you. It's relationship. It's not knowledge. In fact, my dad reminded me of, of a script from Jesus. Who's, oh, was it Jesus? No, I think maybe, I can't remember. I'll have to look up the reference. But he was reminding me that in the Bible, I, I think Jesus said that, that, that the Pharisees look into the word of God and think that by it they will be saved. This doesn't save you. And, man, how do I do this, Lord? Love God. Love God. It's a commandment. But now I want to turn this on its side. I don't want it just to be a commandment. I want to show you who's on the other side of that love. God. Jesus tells this parable about the prodigal son. It's in Luke chapter 7, uh, 15. The prodigal son. The son treats the father like garbage. I want my inheritance. Well, essentially what he's saying is, I don't, I don't want my stuff. I can't wait for you to die. I want it now. An inheritance. You don't get an inheritance until that, that comes to you when, when, when your, your father is deceased. So for him to say, I want my inheritance, was a slap in the face. The father goes, okay. The father representing God. The father, okay. And the boy goes off and uses his father's money that represents his life and spends it on hookers. Goes to a Gentile, to the Gentiles, and parties with them until he runs out of money. We know it's Gentiles because when, when the boy is run out of money, he goes to a pig's stall and eats the pig's food. The Jews weren't raising pigs. So we know that he went far off. He's taking his father's light money. And he's spending it on selfish, hedonistic living. The Bible says, when he came to himself, what a lion, what a lion. There's nothing more powerful than a changed mind. When he came to himself, he thought, my father's servants never want for anything. So he's practicing his speech. So I'll go to the father and say, Father, I've sinned. Heaven's ashamed. I'm no longer worthy to carry your name. But just treat me as one of your servants, and that'll be enough for me. You know, he never does have to give that speech. Here's what's on the other side of the commandment of love God. When the boy was still afar off, the father saw him and ran to him and embraced him. He said, get the robe, get the ring, start cooking dinner, we're gonna have a party. No matter how much you slap God in the face, he'll always be waiting for you. Because he loves you. The proof of Christianity, I've said it many times, is the fact that we still exist. It's the only religion, religion that I know that has a loving God at the helm. I mean pure Christianity. I don't mean those hard-nosed churches that have, un, that have defined God as, as, as hard and, and angry and frustrated. That's not a Christian church. That's not the church that represents the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible doesn't just love, He is love. And He loves you so much 
that he's willing to put up with all of this garbage. It pains him to live without you. It pains him when people choose hell over him. Have you ever been, been in love with someone that doesn't love you back? God. Twist that knife. And twist it and twist it and twist it. Multiply that. Well, first, have you ever felt that your kids didn't love you? Twist, twist, twist. Multiply that by eight billion. The best of us reject God at all moments in our life. God loves us for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to make it so easy to be saved that you just have to believe in him and you have eternal life I'm going to say something, but it's going to be an incomplete sentence, so bear with me. Jesus did not come to make atonement for your sin. He did, but that's an incomplete sentence. Jesus came to make atonement for your sin so that there's now no barrier between you and God. The cross is not about salvation as much as it is about reconciliation. If every person gave their, surrendered their life to Jesus and received his sacrifice, the atonement for their sin, and God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit looked at each other and said, well done. And they went off to another realm and left us in our purity. Who cares? In him we live and move and have our being. He is purpose. I remember I was in my late 20s and I hit a depression. Didn't even know it. I was pastoring at the time. But now that I look back, I can see, I can diagnose myself. <laughs> and I remember right where I was walking up the street. I said, God. I just had this feeling that God, feeling, they're not real. Okay? I had this feeling that God didn't exist. And it just washed over me. And I wanted to die. I wish I'd never been born. And yet I had a ministry. I had a growing family. I, but I didn't want I didn't want to go on. I've often said to God, if you're if you don't exist, I don't want to be here. And God if you don't love me, I don't want to go on. But I'm telling you, with everything that I have, the Bible, there's so many hints and clues in, in the Bible that God loves you. God loves you with an unconditional love. Paul says it like this to the Ephesians. I pray that you would know this, this love that surpasses knowledge. That doesn't make sense. If it surpasses knowledge, how can I know it? I want you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That spirit. That spirit. Right? But when, when God is putting together the, 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 uh, the Torah, the first five books of the law, he's downloading it to Moses. He throws, he throws a couple things in there because it's all, there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of regulations. Do this, do that, you know, don't do this. And there's civil laws and there's moral laws and there's ceremonial laws and it's all dumped in there. But then, then, then uh, every once in a while God will say, Moses, write this down. Hear, O Israel, this is Deuteronomy 6, right in the middle of it. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
You, you hear the heart of God in there. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Listen to the lifestyle. This isn't just a Sunday or, or the Sabbath day, a Saturday, you know, come to me every once in a while. Let impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Always remember that I love you. Love me back. We get distracted by the cares of this world. So therefore our prayers tend to be, Lord, could you do this for me? Could you do that for me? Could you heal this for me? Could you heal that for me? What about my kids? What about my parents? What about my grandkids? What about my grandparents? And it's all requests. We need to learn. Sometimes I'll be sitting at, in my gazebo. It's like our outdoor living room. I'll be sitting there. And my son will come home. And quite often he'll just walk into the house. But when he walks across that yard, Even if there's no conversation, he just sits down and we look at each other and go, it's the end of the day, you did it. I did it. To just sit there. To just sit there. And I think when we go to God, and all of a sudden, isn't it something that he's always attentive to you? That when all of a sudden you go, oh, that's right. God, God's here. That, that you look and there he's looking at you. Just waiting for you to acknowledge him. And you just say, God, I love you. Let's sit here together. That's why he did all of this. Look at it all. That's why he did all of this. For those moments, man, I can dive into, into the revelation when, when he's got the incense, which are the prayers of the people, and he's just smothering himself with the incense, with all the conversations, with all of the silence, with all the be still and know, with all of the times that you just turn to him and look at him. And he just smothers himself and he gets lost in that. There's something that it keeps keeps coming to my mind, and, and I know I won't be able to articulate it, but there's something about you being in his image that just destroys his heart in a good way. Like that, or you can destroy his heart, or you can make his heart bound. The angels, when they appeared, when we did the study, we can see that they, they, they can show up in human form. But our human form, that, that's not the definition of the image. There's, there's something more like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we have a spirit, and we have a soul, and we have a brain, and we have a flesh, and we almost, we're almost a trinity. I'm not gonna make that in the doctrine, I'm just saying, you are in the image of God. If you made something, not just in your likeness, but in your image if you could replicate your spirit and and make something in your likeness and then blow your spirit put your mouth over the nostrils and, oh. and they woke up and they looked at you what type of relationship would you want with him with our earth. How would it feel to be rejected by your image? For God so loved the world that he took the rejection for you. He loves you. Come back to your first love. Nothing else should come close. In fact, any other relationship that goes above God 
I used to teach it, it was called the seat of contentment. And, and only, only God should be in your seat of contentment. If I put Crystal in my seat of contentment, she's now in charge of, of making me content. When something happens, because we're all flawed human beings, all of a sudden I'm not just dealing with whatever the issue is, I'm now dealing with the loss of my contentment. Oh, we rise up and fight there, don't we? But when God is in that seat of contentment, then I can deal. I can deal with Crystal. I can deal with the kids. I can deal with, with you know, the relationships. Because God makes me stable. Nobody else does. So nothing else should come close. <clears throat> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I think that's amazing. That that's his desire. Do you see that? That's his desire. We love him because he first loved us. All of the pursuits of Revelation 2, all of the pursuits of 1 Corinthians 13, all of the pursuits in Luke chapter, I can't even remember where it was when Jesus said, you know, I never knew you, Matthew chapter 7, all those pursuits and put them all aside. Love God. Love God. God, we just take this moment now and we say we love you. We love you. Lord, we're sorry for paying attention to other things more than you. It's difficult. You are invisible. But we're also reminded that your invisible qualities are clearly seen in creation, in each other. So Lord, open the eyes of our heart. We, we prayed that already at the beginning. Open the eyes of our heart. We want to see you. We want to see you everywhere we go, in every corner, in every street, in every room. We want to see you walk with us. Great Father. Jesus, Brother. Holy Spirit. Comforter. Walk with us. Thank you for loving us. We love you, God.